this morning uh, I don't know how you got in here I don't know the noises that are around you but I want to read from the word of the Lord and I want us to honor it as we stand so would you close your eyes and take a deep breath allow the breath of life enter your nostrils and I want you to focus for a minute and, and let go of everything as we read God's word I want to read from Psalm 46 verses 7 through 11 this is what it says this is what the word of the Lord says this morning it says the Lord Almighty is with us the God of Jacob is our fortress come and see what the Lord has done the desolations he has brought on the earth he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth he breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shields with fire he says he says to you and me this morning, He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to study Your Word here this morning, I pray that Your Word would live in our hearts. God, I pray that this morning we would be able to surrender it all. Knowing that you are our fortress. Knowing that you are our king. God, I pray that every soul in this room would be able to be still before you and say that you are God. May you reign. May your spirit be ever present here this morning. I pray this in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Thanks, Doug. I, I just want to take a minute to thank our band this morning. You know, we, we started three services this morning, and they have had to come up earlier than normal. And it's, it's challenging, guys. i got to tell you, it's challenging. But I, I came here this morning. I wasn't expecting much for our first service. I was like, even if there are four people, we're going to look at God's Word. There was like 50 people here. <laughs> Praise God. But this morning, we are starting this new series called Above the Noise, in which we are going to study what it looks like to stand still before God and proclaim that He is God, knowing that He will take care of, of, of our every need, that He's, He's in control, He's in charge. But um, it, talking about being still before God and getting above the noise is not something that we can just do in a half an hour session of studying God's Word here together. It's something you have to develop yourself and learn throughout the time. That's why before we even get started, I want to challenge you, if you have not considered Signing up for the class that our elder Rick Foti is going to start called Journey of a Lifetime. The sign up is back there. I really challenge you to sign up for that. In that class you will learn what it means to live a gospel-centered life. And if I didn't have to preach on Sundays, I would be in this class. So I really want you guys to consider that. Also, if you are a gentleman, I want to tell you this. I'm starting my men's group back up tomorrow. We're going to study the, the book of 1 John. It's a time for you to be in fellowship with other men and also look at God's Word. So I challenge you to sign up for that. Or you don't need to sign up. Just show up tomorrow at 6.30 right here at church. And I encourage you to come join, that, join, us, join me, join us for that, okay? But this morning as we start this series, uh, Above the Noise, we live in a world where there's so much noise and clutter. And some of you, I don't know how you got into the church this morning. Some of you may, came, may have come here because your lives are so cluttered right now. And you thought to yourself, you know, if I go to church maybe just maybe i can find some peace in my heart and let go of some of the clutterness in my in my brain right now in my heart right now or maybe you are one of those people who say you know there is no noise uh, i i am a perfect holy person i don't need anything um you might be the noise yourself um just just so you know and some of you may have come here this morning sitting like this saying pastor bless me if you can doesn't matter what category you fit in here this morning. It doesn't matter. We are going to look at God's Word. We are going to talk about Jesus. And, and two weeks ago, um, I was in Colorado Springs. I was doing an intensive course class for my degree in Christian counseling. And it was the last thing I had to do it. I had to do it. and had to be there. And it's 8 o'clock in Colorado time. It was 7 o'clock our time. I, I, got in the, I sat in the class. And I, am thinking, I was thinking about you guys. I was thinking I would rather be with my life, my family. I was missing you guys, but I was like, this is something I got to do. I am sitting in there. The professor walks in, and an amazing guy, he walks in and he starts saying, I want to start with a devotional. And we're like, right on. So he starts, and the first, the first phrase he says captivates my heart so much that I didn't pay attention to anything else for the next two hours. He, he said to me, he said this to the whole class, said, when you talk about Jesus, he shows up. 
He said, when you're talking about Jesus, he shows up. And for the next two hours, I was just with Jesus because he had showed up in my heart. He was right there with me. And you know what? Here's the thing. For the most, for the most of my, my Christian walk, I thought that if I talk about Jesus, maybe, just maybe, I will create an opportunity for him to show up. If I talk about Jesus to you or somebody else, maybe, maybe that person will allow Jesus to show up in his life. I never considered that. That's why it was so captivating. When you talk about Jesus, he just shows up. You don't have to wait for him to show up. Now, he's going to show up here this morning because we are going to talk about him. Are you ready for Jesus to show up? It's not a matter of, of him showing up. It's a matter of are you ready for him to show, to show up? So if you are ready, I want to challenge you to open up to 2 Chronicles. We are going to look at the Old Testament. You may say, Nasser, you talk about the Old Testament a lot. Well, here's the thing. I believe that the Old Testament talks about Jesus nonstop. Whether you believe it or not, it talks about Jesus nonstop. And this morning, the story that we are going to look at, the, the passage that we are going to look at, I was dealing with some stuff in my heart this week. I wasn't planning to use this passage, but God constantly brought this passage in my heart and constantly taught me about the, the fact that I need to be still before Him and remember this as I was facing my own battles. And we're going to talk about battles and some sort of battles in our lives this morning. And you may say, well, Nasser, you also talk about, at this church, you guys talk about storms and battles all the time. What's the deal with that? Well, why just storms and battles all the time? But here's the thing. I believe that a warrior is not ready for war unless he's ready to anticipate all the enemy's moves. And I am going, we are going, as a church leadership, we are going to preach and teach about battles and storms all the time until we know that you are ready to defeat the enemy. Okay? So this morning we are going to, to look at Second Chronicles chapter 20. And this passage is, is such an important, amazing passage here. If, so open up to it. Um, verse 1 starts like this. We're going to start from verse 1. It says, after this, so let me write, pause right here. It says, after this. After what? Um, so you read after this, after what? What happened? After this. Um, it says after this, you got to go back to chapter 19. And chapter 19 tells us after what? Chapter 19 tells us that Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was a godly king. He followed the, the ways of King David. He was a while after King David, but unlike some of the other kings that were before and after him, he was a good king, he was a godly king, and he tried to follow God's path. But he says chapter 19 that he, he appointed some judges over Judah. And judges, if you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe it, it kind of like, maybe we can say they're like elders, okay? The spiritual oversight for the nation. It's people, so he picked these people to keep him accountable. He picked these people to keep the nation accountable. And it's really interesting for me, I don't know if you can connect with it or not. It says after he picked some elders or judges to keep the nation and him accountable, right after that, okay? That's how our story starts. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites, with some of the Munites, along with some termites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. He says right after, right after he starts, see right after he finds a way to keep himself accountable, have people to keep him accountable. Right after he decides, says, I am going to follow God's path, I don't want our nation to fall astray from God's path, right after that the enemy wages war. So important. Because many of you may have come here, you think that if I go to church, this, things are going to be great. When you decide to follow the path of God, things are not going to go as great as you thought. The enemy does not like that. He's going to wage war. So right after this, these, these, all these people come to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazesnan Tamar, that is En Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat went to a corner and started crying and said, Why does everybody hate me? <laughs> Your translation doesn't say that? Well, maybe this is a different translation. I don't know. No, this is so interesting. It's alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire from the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek Him. And I find this very interesting because, because we've been talking about prayer for the past four weeks. And just because we've talked about prayer and preached about prayer, we're not going to stop talking about prayer. It's the essence of our faith. In fact, you guys wrote about 2,000 names on the wall of people who need to find the love of Christ. Those names are in our prayer room. They're going to be there to the end of the year. We're going to pray for them still. But this story reminds us, it allows us to go back and restudy the things that we have talked about. If you have so much noise in your life and the enemy is bringing the battle to you, eliminate noise. 
by turning panic into prostration. And I know so many of you maybe don't like that word prostration. And I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of it myself either. But, but the word prostration, I'm not talking about prostitution here, okay? I'm not talking about, I'm not t- telling you to turn panic into prostitution or turn it into your prostate. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about turning panic into prostration. And prostration literally means to fall face down before God. Turn panic into prostration. And many of us, many of us may, may think like, Nasser, I'm in the midst of terror. How can I prostrate myself before God? How can I fall before the presence of God? How can I do that? My job is on the line. My family is on the line. Our, our situation is not going well. Do you have any idea what's going on? Turn panic into prostration. Turn panic to prayer. See, for most of our lives, we try to set our minds into prosecuting the Creator. We try to put him on, on the seat to prosecute him, to say, to say that he's, he's the, the author of our pain, he's the author of our issues, he's the author of, our, of our, our problems. We put him on the hot seat and we try to prosecute him using his handiwork and his creation to bring him judgment. Meanwhile, we forget that his very absence from our lives is the causality of imminent terror. We, we decide to ourselves, we try so hard to, to justify our actions. We work so hard to justify our actions to say, I have to figure out how, why I'm not successful in my life, why things are not going the way they need to go. So we try to justify by by coming with reasons. We we work so hard to create reasons of why we are failing so miserably. And meanwhile, instead instead of really thinking of solutions, we are creating noise in our head. We're creating noise and we don't realize, see, we don't realize that the very fact that we are causing, we are, we are creating noise in our minds, is stopping us from falling before God. And it stops us from realizing that the very thing that saves us from the horrors that we have set ourselves upon is being still before the Lord. To be still and know that He is God. So we create panic. You see, panic, turning panic into prostration when we are in panic, it is so hard to not, to not, to be able to pray. It's really difficult. I remember last, not this Saturday, but the Saturday before, um, we were at home at 7 o'clock at night, and my daughter was jumping on the bed. She's two years old. She was jumping on the bed, and our bed is pretty high. She was jumping, and she fell right, landed right on her nose. She fell on the ground and ran right on her nose. And I pick her up. I see blood. So I'm like panicking. My wife comes. We're panicking. Her is bruised. We're panicking. Like, oh no, her nose is broken. I don't want her nose to be broken like mine. Uh, so uh, we're panicking. We have no idea what to do. Like we're, we're trying to put clothes on. We, 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 she's, she doesn't have any clothes on. We try to put clothes on her. We get in the car. We jump in the car trying to drive to the emergency room. We drive into the emergency room. I, I'm, I'm driving. I'm panicking. Like my, I can't, I'm shaking. And my wife is like trying to calm her down. And my wife stops and says, let's pray. And I can't tell you how much I appreciated that. Turning panic into prostration. As soon as she prayed, peace came over my body. So we go to the emergency room. Thankfully, her nose wasn't broken. But as she's being, um, pictures being taken, x-rays being taken off her nose. She's two years old. She goes to the guy who is doing the x-rays and she says, Is this the place where the doctor checks the monkeys who jump on the bed? When you turn panic into prostration, when you turn panic into prayer, you allow God to take control. Chapter, verse 5, well, I'm not going to read it, but verse 5 tells us that Jehoshaphat was a godly man. He was a godly leader. And something that I want you to go home and mark this in your Bibles and read this, okay? Read this for yourself later on. Jehoshaphat stands up before the assembly. See, Jehoshaphat didn't just prostrate himself before God, but he also asked everybody to fast. Because now there's a vast army coming to attack. Let's go, all of us, before God. If we, all treated, if we all treated our problems like that, our problems would be nothing. See, Jehoshaphat is a godly leader. Now, parents, you got to learn that as well. As parents, we got to lead our kids to learn that in, in the midst of panic and terror, they can depend on God. Jehoshaphat, as a godly king, stands up before the assembly, before all the, all the people of Judah, and says this elaborate prayer it goes from verse 5 to verse 12. Now, I want to encourage you to go home and read it later on. I want to focus on verse 12 real quick. As he prays and he's finishing his prayer, he says, Our God, will you not judge them? 
God, we are trying to follow you. We are trying to do the right thing. Will you not judge the enemy? And this is what it says. For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. There's a, there's a time in your life that you have to come to the conclusion of saying that on my own, I am so weak that I cannot even stand against my enemy. You have to come to the conclusion of saying, on my own, I am so weak that I can't even stand before my enemy. I can't stand before God. I am defeated already. And that's the only time when you can tap into the strength that comes from God. So he says, God, God, we cannot do this on our own. What are we supposed to do? There's a vast army that is attacking us. We have no power to do anything with them. But it says, we do not know. Listen, we do not know what to do. But our eyes, but our eyes are on you. When there's so much noise in your life, when this world is trying to clutter your minds, eliminate noise by putting your eyes on God. Have you ever tried to carry a tray of drinks? Anybody been a waiter, waiter or waitress before? Have you tried to carry a uh, tray of drinks? It's whoever filled it is filled up all the way. Like, and you're looking and it's like, there's no way I can get it to the destination without spilling this. You're looking at this and naturally, naturally, psychologically, what you do is you look at the tray and you try to walk. But here's what happens. As you're looking at the tray, trying to walk to where you're going slowly and slowly you're trying to go, you're naturally looking at this and you're spilling it. Do you know why it spills? Because your brain sends a signal to your legs and your legs walk faster in an imbalanced way. It's a scientific thing. You are looking at the tray. You are looking at the problem. And as you are looking at the problems, your leg can't keep up with your eyes. So you walk in an imbalanced way and you spill. So meanwhile, your problem is spilling, going all over the place. And instead of looking at the tray, once you put your, your eyes on the destination, all of a sudden your legs and your body move at the same rate and you can actually walk without a spilling. So here's what happens. Instead of looking at the problem, you look at the solution that is Jesus Christ. So you look at the, the problem and you say, I'm not going to spill you. So you look at the destination that is Jesus Christ and you walk towards Jesus. And as you're walking towards Jesus, you are still carrying the problem. You're still carrying the problem. You haven't given it to him yet. But meanwhile, you're not spilling the problem all over the place. Amen. Because your eyes are on Christ. And he's the destination. Amen. So put your eyes on Christ. Verse 13 says, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Everybody, all, all of Judah is standing before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and descendant, of, and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. And I told you this a few weeks ago. I said, every time you see in the scripture, the son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, it's written, so you go check it out. It's a true story. This is not a fiction. So the Spirit of God comes on this guy, and this is what he says. <clears throat> This is what he says. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. And I want you to hear this, hear this as the Lord is saying the same thing to you. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. LifePoint Church, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast army. There might be an army before you, but do not be afraid or discouraged, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Would you touch your neighbor and say, this is not my battle? See, eliminate noise. Eliminate noise by knowing that the battle is not yours. Most of us, Enter the circumstances of life thinking that it's ours to defeat. We get into war thinking that it's our battle. Meanwhile, God is telling you, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. But put your faith in me because the battle is not yours. And then this continues. Verse 16 says, tomorrow march down against, the, against them. They will be climbing up the, up the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Amen. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them. 
tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. Listen, this is an interesting uh, picture right here. I don't know how you see this battle being raised, okay? Um, imagine, imagine me, okay, against all of you. This is how it was, okay? I don't know how many people um, Jehoshaphat had, but it wasn't many. That's why they were panicking. But the army of, of the enemy is huge. There's three or four different groups of people coming together, waging war against Judah. Again, I have no, no chance of defeating all of you. It's impossible. I mean, I might take a few of you down, but that's it. Eventually, you will overcome and defeat me. And, and here's the thing. God doesn't tell. See, this is interesting, but God doesn't tell Jehoshaphat and his army. God doesn't tell them, now Jehoshaphat and the army, people of Judah, go in your tents, turn on your 60-inch TV, turn on Netflix, watch a binge TV show, binge, binge watch something. I will take care of the battle for you. That's not what God says. God doesn't say, okay, people of Judah, go in your tents. Don't worry about the battle. The battle is not yours. What does he tell them? Take up your positions. Take up your positions. See, because God wants you, when he's giving you your deliverance, when he's defeating the enemy, he wants you to stand and see that he is good. He wants you to stand and see that he is glorious. But most of us, this, the way we treat it is either we, don't, we fight on our own, or when we fight, we just go sit. God, take care of it. No. God doesn't tell them to go sharpen their swords. God doesn't tell them to go find more ammunition, get their arrows ready. He says, just stand and take your positions. And let me show you what I can do. Because if you are not standing and taking your positions, then you can't see what He can do. And God wants that glory. Once you see what He can do, then you will never turn back. So the battle is not yours. Verse 18 says, actually, before I go to verse 18, verse 17 still says, do not be afraid. Um, at the end of verse 17 says, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. We just read that in a few, a few seconds ago. But here's what happens. There's a, in psychology, there is a, um, there is this concept that says people who are developed properly and, and, and there's many different theories on human development and cognitive development of humanity. But, but people who are developed properly, it says that there are three stages that people are developed into. And the first one is, is, is and there's, as I said, there's many different people with many different theories. I'm using just one of them to give you an example. That the people are born, children are born to be dependent. Okay? In other words, there's no, none of you who have given birth to a child or have had a child... And the child was born, and immediately the child said, Mom, Dad, I'm going to change my own diapers. <laughs> you don't need to feed me. I got it. None of, none of your children, were, if, if that happened, it was a miracle, right? None of you have seen that. So children are born to be dependent, which makes sense. We are born to be dependent, and we learn to be dependent. But throughout that process, you're becoming depend, dependent to your parents and to society. This is what happens. Then your parents, who are good parents, will try their hardest to teach their kids to be independent. In other words, in our culture today, that's not happening very well with so many parents is that you see people who are in their 30s still playing video games and living with their moms because their parents never taught them how to be independent. It is such an important thing for success that you got to teach the kids to learn to be independent. It's something that you learn. It's something that you develop. But then there's a last stage according to science that says that a person... Growing up, a person also has to learn or adapt or, or come to the realization of the need that he has for being codependent. See, you can't go from being dependent to independent, but now you realize, for instance, when it comes to your sexual needs, you can't just satisfy yourself all the time. So God is designing you in such a way that you need a partner. You need a husband or a wife. I know many people go in the wrong direction with that, but you need a husband and a wife. To be codependent, you realize that you on your own, you can't defeat every battle. You realize that on your own, you can't do everything, so you need... To be codependent. That's why people get married. That's why people find friends, have BFFs. But then here's what happens. Something that science doesn't tell you. And this comes along the line with all of that. Now good parents have to teach that their kids. Um, something that perhaps you learn from going to church. Something that you learn from reading God's word. Is that you have to get to a point of being theodependent. 
And Theo is a word for God, being dependent on God, being a God-centered person, having the gospel, having the spirit of God at the center of every decision you make. And this is what has happened with Jehoshaphat right here, as we can see. Jehoshaphat learned to be independent, learned to be independent, and he also learned to be codependent. That's why he, he appointed some judges to keep him accountable. But in the midst of it all, he prostrated himself before God because he was Theo-dependent. Are you going to choose to be developed properly? Or are you going to choose to be dependent on this world and yourselves? Look at verse 18. It says, Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah, all the people of Judah fell down in worship. He didn't just bow down himself, but all the people followed the leader. Fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Kohathites and Korahite stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. The other army is, is screaming, and they're loud. The battle rages, or the battle cries are going up. And instead of listening to those battle cries of the other army, they create their own noise by worshiping God. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tokoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets, and you will be successful. Be theodependent, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army. Give thanks to the Lord. They're singing. Listen, they're singing. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Eliminate noise. We talked about this um, a while back also. I want to kind of refresh in your mind. Eliminate noise by turning fear into faith. Okay, turning fear into faith. And here's what happens. Uh, this is a comical picture. Okay, this is, this is a really comical picture. I want you to imagine. There's an army of two, three thousand, okay, standing. And back then there was honor in war. Okay, there was honor in war. It wasn't like, sometimes the two armies would stand for days, take their positions, and they would stand for days until the two could come to, to an agreement. Are you ready for us to attack you now? Are you ready for us to attack you now? There, would, it, there was honor. They wouldn't just sometimes come and just attack each other. It wasn't bombs and things like that. They would just push a button and kill everybody. There was honor in war. And these people, I want you to imagine this. These people are standing, okay, and they're seeing each other. So Jehoshaphat's army is a small army. They're standing and they're seeing the army of the enemy and they're looking at the army of the enemy. There's thousands upon thousands of people and they have probably their shields. They're hitting their shields with their swords and they're screaming with their battle cries and they're like, we're going to kill you, we're going to kill you. Imagine that, okay? Meanwhile, Jehoshaphat's army, this is comical. They're saying, Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? can only imagine the other army is looking at them like they're insane they are insane but listen to this verse 22 says as they began to sing and praise let me read it one more time okay as they began to sing and praise let me read it one more time in case it didn't hit as they began to sing and praise the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were they were the Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. See, they are singing and they are praising. And as they begin worshiping God, all of a sudden God goes crazy and sets ambushes against the enemy. And they go against each other and they kill each other, annihilate each other and destroy each other. And the Jehoshaphat's army is like, what is going on? We are singing to God, what's going on? Guys, this is really important for us because so often we have no idea how important it is to worship God. In the midst of your songs to God, in the midst of worshiping God, God defeats your battles. You have to remember to worship God. You have to remember to say, worship is not coming on Sundays and singing a few songs. Worship is something you live. And in the midst of your battles, when you sing to God, God is right there. And it says, it says the, the Ammonites and the Meonites and all these people slaughtered each other. And they literally became like termites that were crushed. And then it tells us, read the rest of it on your own at home. It tells us that Jehoshaphat's army went and there was not a single soul left. And there was so much plunder that they could not carry it all. 
1 John 5, 5 says this, Who is it that overcomes the world? Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. You think your battles are yours? On your own, you can't overcome the world. Amen. But when you believe Jesus is the Son of God, you overcome the battles of this world. You may look at it and say, well, why is it that Jehoshaphat was with God, or God was with Jehoshaphat? Would you open up to um, chapter 17, go three, a few pages over back, chapter 17 of Second Chronicles. And it tells us why God was with Jehoshaphat. It says, the Lord, verse 3 says, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of his father David before him. He did not consult the Baals, and if you don't know what Baals are, they're terrible idols. Jehoshaphat followed the ways of his father David. In other words, David followed the ways of God. And Jehoshaphat followed that, and he did not go create idols, he did not worship idols, he worshiped God alone. Verse 4 says this, verse 4 says, But he sought the God of his father and followed his commands rather than the practices of Israel. Instead of looking at the culture and saying, I am going to bow to you culture, I am going to give in and compromise, he did not bow down to the culture of Israel. And when you do that, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to go to a battle and start singing praises. It doesn't make sense. But when you give in to the ways of the culture, you are already defeated. So I want you to, I want you to understand this here this morning. I want to read one more verse for you guys before I'm done. Uh, would you open up with me to Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Would you mark this? Would you underline this passage in your Bibles? Would you let this passage speak to you this morning? Would you let this passage would be, the, be the grounding passage or verse for you guys in your hearts? Would you allow God to use this passage in your lives? Philippians 1, 6, Apostle Paul, you may look at me and say, No, sir, you're taking this passage out of context. Here's the thing. This is the inspired Word of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that this is the inspired Word of God? If this is the inspired Word of God, the words that our Apostle Paul are, is writing to the Philippians is as alive today as, as it was for them back then. It is as transformative for them as, as uh, for us today as it was for them. It is going to impact you if you allow it. So it doesn't matter that it was written to the Philippians. It is going to apply to you because it is applicable in your lives. And this is what it says, Apostle Paul is praying. Apostle Paul is telling them, saying, be confident, being confident of this, be sure of this, some of the translations say, being confident of this, that, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to his completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He looks at Dave and says, Dave, guess what? Be confident of this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to his completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Vince, he who began the good work in you will carry it on to his completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It's not you who began the good work, but it's God who began the good work in you. It is not you who, who chose to do the good things in you. It is God who chose to do the good things in your life. It's not you who is standing in front of the battle. It is God who is standing in front of the battle for you guys. And He's going ahead to defeat the battle because He began the good work in you. And He who began the good work in you will carry it on to His completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. He's coming and He promises to complete that. He promises to complete the good work in you. But are you going to allow Him? That's how Jehoshaphat eliminated noise, by being confident in God's faithfulness. Are you confident in God's faithfulness? Are you confident today in God's faithfulness? Are you confident that He who began the good work in you will carry it on to His completion until the day of Jesus Christ? Would you stand up with me one more time? I read for you, I read for you Psalm 46, part of Psalm 46, and you had no idea the context of what I was going to talk about. You had no idea, but now you do. And now I want you to close your eyes one more time and take another deep breath and allow this passage sink in your hearts. This is our prayer as we finish today. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. 
Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations He has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, this is what He says to you and me here this morning. Can you get excited about this? He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Prayer team members, would you surround the room, please? I want to challenge you here. I want this to be the norm of our church. You have the freedom to come and kneel before God. Use this the stage if that's what it takes. Come kneel. If you want to kneel in your chairs, go ahead, kneel. This, don't be afraid to prostrate yourselves before the Lord. Allow the fear to be taken away. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you. And as we talk about you, we know you're right here right now. God, we know that your spirit is moving amongst us. God, we know that your spirit is working in our lives right now. God, we believe that the convictions that we are receiving are coming from you. Lord, we believe that, that the, the, the pain that we may be suffering or going through right now, it is, it is yours right now. God, we give our battles to you right now, Jesus. God, I pray for, for what we read, the passages that we read would be with, our, with us throughout our lives, that we would remember that you began the good work in our lives. And God, I pray that we would remember that because you began the good work in us, you will carry it on to its completion until the day you come back. And when you come back, you will take us as your bride. And we will spend eternity singing praises to you. Lord Jesus, I pray for those who are dealing with some really hard things right now in their lives. I pray that the peace and the comfort that comes from the Spirit of Jesus Christ would be in their hearts and you would overwhelm them right now with such peace that they cannot, they do have no idea what is coming from the, the surpassing peace that comes from the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, work in our hearts and our lives today. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.